What do we see in these works of art? How has the artist depicted the space? Over time, artists have made drastic changes on how to depict the natural world, both in representation and approach. In this video, we will look at the genre of Western landscape painting. A brief introduction to Western landscape painting. Landscape painting can be described as the depiction of natural scenery in art. This includes mountains, valleys, bodies of water, fields, forests, coasts, and may or may not include man-made structures as well as people. Today, the landscape continues to be a major theme in art to explore the ways we relate, live, and record the places we live in. Throughout time, landscape painting has evolved into three basic categories. Representational, Impressionistic, Abstracted, Paintings that appear non-objective with heavy artistic abilities. Let's dig in. First, we need to understand a little background information. Landscape painting has a long history in Eastern art as it was established as a tradition in China all the way back by the 4th century. In this video, we are going to focus only on the Western tradition for the sake of time. In the West, meaning Europe, the tradition of landscape painting was not as established as in the East. Landscapes were done in ancient and classical periods, but it wasn't a genre on its own. This didn't happen until the Renaissance in the 16th century. But we are getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's backtrack a bit. Around the 1300s, landscapes were done, but they were background settings for narrative paintings, paintings that tell stories. The Italian and French artists incorporated landscapes into their history paintings to make the narrative scenes for the figures or characters depicted in the art. These narrative paintings were usually biblical or mythological stories and were highly prestigious. The landscape genre, however, wasn't established to stand on its own as a finished piece of art. They had a low position in the genre hierarchy. In the 16th century, or 1500s, this started to change with Flemish, or Dutch artist, Peter Bruegel the Elder. He was a master landscape painter who offered scenic views of everyday life. His paintings were a major influence on the later Dutch Golden Age. Between the 15th and 17th century, the Renaissance occurs in Italy. It was a time of change and rebirth from the previous Middle Ages or medieval period. This time period was interested in the Greeks and Romans. Humanism flourished. Humanism was a way of thought that focused on the potential for human achievement with a visual stress on geometric proportions and aesthetic beauty. Ah, doesn't that sound nice? The Renaissance included heavyweight artists such as da Vinci, Michelangelo, Botticelli, Donatello, Raphael, and Titian. The Renaissance brought significant breakthroughs with the development of a system of perspective, which allowed views to be represented realistically. It was a pretty big deal at the time. In the 17th century, things continue to evolve. During this time, the landscape itself finally starts to take over the history subjects. Their representations were highly stylized and idyllic, and artificial. They tried to evoke the landscape of classical Greece and Rome, and thus their work became known as classical landscape. During this time, we have the Dutch Golden Age and Baroque art. Let's start with the Dutch. Dutch landscape painters, such as Jacob van Roysdale, were developing a much more naturalistic form of landscape painting, based on what they saw around them. Landscape painting exploded during this Golden Age between 1588 to 1672. It emphasized characteristics of Dutch landscape features, villages, windmills, and rural life. Cityscapes and landscapes with animals in the foreground also became popular. The Dutch emphasized views of urban life and painted landscapes with domestic animals such as cows and horses in the foreground. Jan Vermeer included a more panoramic view of the skyline in his view of a city street here. These types of landscapes were popular for patrons as they gave a sense of national pride and included elements symbolizing various Dutch values. For example, cows symbolize prosperity and the virtues of Dutch rural life. Rembrandt's dramatic focus on a windmill evoked an identifying symbol of the Netherlands. This classical approach continues to develop as we next move into the Baroque period. Baroque art flourished from the early 17th century to the 1740s. It is characterized by great drama, rich, deep color, and intense light and dark shadows. Baroque brought images for religious worship back into the public eye. Baroque painters thought that the art should be easily understood and felt by common people with the effect of encouraging piety and an awe for the church. You can see Dutch artist Peter Paul Rubens has highly charged compositions that reference aspects of classical and Christian history. The use of chiaroscuro 
or light and dark, was heavily used. It helped create dramatic tension. Caravaggio was a master with this. His work became highly influential to many Baroque painters, including Peter Paul Rubens, Giovanni Lorenzo Bernini, Jose Ribiera, and Rembrandt. Nicolas Poussin was a French artist, but mostly worked in Rome. His paintings had extraordinary dramatic depth and allegorical complexity. Claude Lorrain, another French painter, worked outdoors with great observation, detail, and blended idealism with nature to produce work almost more beautiful than nature itself. He advanced the portrayal of natural light and was one of the first artists to pay close attention to sunrises and sunsets. We will next view the transformation to the luxurious. In the 18th century, landscape painting moves to England and France. With precise detail and delicate coloring, French painters Antoine Watteau, Fragonard, and Francois Boucher developed romantic outdoor scenes that glorified nature. These elaborate decorative landscapes were filled with beautifully dressed men and women enjoying outdoor amusements and leisure time with shows of luxury. Bling bling. The English Rococo landscape tradition was led by Richard Wilson, who painted in Italy as well as in his native England. This best known painting shows a group of people fishing at a lake framed by mountains. It exemplifies his peaceful style. Other English landscape painters of note include Thomas Girton, John Robert Cozens, and Thomas Gainsborough, who was also well known for his portraiture. Rising in opposition to the overly decorative and gaudy styles of Rococo and Baroque, neoclassicism in the mid-18th century was a style again based on the antiquity of Greece and Rome. It invoked harmony, clarity, restraint, universality, and idealism. It was a revival in classical thought. This mirrored what was going on in political and social arenas of the time, leading to the French Revolution. The primary neoclassicist belief was that art should express the ideal virtues in life and could improve the viewer by delivering a moralizing message. It had the power to transform society as society itself was being transformed by new approaches to government and the Industrial Revolution. So industrialization and urbanization are increasing in the early to mid 1800s. It is at this time that landscape painting finally emerges as a respectable genre. This romantic movement sees compositions filled with passion and drama. These artists stress the individual's connection to nature and an idealized past. They also painted en plein air or outdoors with the invention of tube paint in 1841 and portable easels. In England, we have John Constable and J.M.W. Turner, both expressing the power of nature and the atmospheric qualities of the weather. Constable worked in a realist mode with his English countryside paintings, where Turner worked depicting expressionistic and atmospheric seascapes that verged on abstraction. In America, artists were centered at the Hudson River School in New York. These artists captured light and shade and the untouched beauty of the landscapes of Catskill Mountains, the Hudson River, and New England. In the 1830s, we also had the introduction of photography. This will greatly impact the next wave of artists. Let's move to France in the 1860s. These artists decide to paint what they see and feel. Remember, photography has been introduced. Was there a need to realistically depict a landscape anymore? Instead, these artists favored a more subjective form of expression and moved away from romanticism and realistic renderings. These artists will become labeled as the Impressionists. Claude Monet, Camille Pizarro, Pierre Auguste Renoir, Edgar Degas, and Berthe Marisot also worked outdoors and recorded the effects of light and weather. They had a loose application of paint, visible brushwork, and an inventive use of color. This was groundbreaking and influenced future generations of artists. They were not interested in depicting as their predecessors, nor did they seek perfection. Instead, the Impressionists tried to capture an impression of how a landscape, thing, or person appeared to them at a certain moment in time. Initially, the public were rather hostile to them. These guys, however, would be setting the stage for the emergence of modern art. Neo, or post-Impressionism, was a parallel movement alongside Impressionism. Like the Impressionists, they also wished to experiment with optics. Look here at the work of George Seurat. He used a technique called pointillism, which was the application of dots alongside other colored dots so that when seen from a distance would blend. With these post-impressionists, we get the angular and masterful color work of Paul Cézanne, the thick application of paint of Vincent van Gogh. 
the symbolic work of Paul Gauguin, and the depictions of everyday bohemian life from Toulouse-Lautrec. These artists moved away from art being a window onto reality, to instead a window of the artist's mind and soul. These artists would continue to influence and impact into the modernist period of the 20th century, which is where we are headed next. From about 1898 to 1906 in France, André Durand, Raoul Dufy, Henri Matisse, and Maurice de Vlaminck continued to go a step further and apply brilliant, vivid, and expressive colors to their canvas, to some parts of the canvas even exposed. They emphasized the two-dimensionality of their surface and used color as an expressive tool rather than a realistic one. As the Impressionists before them, they were also criticized, with one critic seeing their work and exclaiming, Les Fauves, which translates to wild beasts. The name stuck. Fauvism was established. Just after the Fauves, around 1907-1908, another development has a huge impact and becomes popular. Pablo Picasso and George Brock present Cubism. They explore ways to represent different views or perspectives of their subjects at the same time, which makes their work appear fragmented and abstracted. In Germany at the same time, Expressionism is happening. The Die Brücke group were using an expressive use of bold color and line. Carl Schmidt Rutloff, Eric Heckel, and Ernst Ludwig Kirchner applied dark contours and deep colors to canvas and continued to show a move further toward abstraction. An offshoot of Expressionism was the Blue Rider group. This was a loose group of associated artists, including Vasily Kandinsky, Gabriel Munter, and Franz Marc. They all attached great spiritual value to their work and believed in the emotional power of color. Franz Marc's numerous landscapes with animals are composed of simple forms painted in bold primary colors. Keep in mind, we also have the First World War occurring between 1914 and 1918. Tom Thompson was a Canadian painter, and his death in 1917 left a legacy that would influence the Group of Seven. These were artists from 1920 to 1933 that included Franklin Carmichael, Lauren Harris, A.Y. Jackson, Frank Johnson, Arthur Lismer, J.E.H. MacDonald, Frederick Varley, and later A.J. Casson. Emily Carr was also associated with the group. They felt Canadian art could be developed through direct contact with nature and depicted the rugged Canadian landscape. They were the first major Canadian national art movement. We are now into the 1920s and see the rise of surrealism. These artists were about the human experience, the subconscious, and dreams. Max Ernst, Salvador Dali, René Magritte, Joan Miro, and others all depicted the natural with the imaginary. As illustrated, landscape painting underwent a huge shift and was challenged. From the 1950s, the shift was moving towards abstraction. Modern American painters such as Georgia O'Keeffe, Arthur Dove, John Marin, and Marsden Hartley demonstrate this. In the mid-20th century, artists such as Richard Ebenkorn and Helen Frankenthaler, amongst others, embraced the freedom of abstraction to transform by way of line, color, and form the last remaining remnants of the traditional landscape into mere suggestions of the natural and built world. In the early 1960s, Richard Diebenkorn used the shapes and colors of the Northern California landscape as a structural framework for his paintings. You can see gridded structures and aerial-like vantage points. His abstract canvases are landscapes by feeling and suggestion. Alex Katz's landscapes and portraits have flat planes of rich, lovely color. Katz developed his signature style as a reaction against the abstract expressionist movement. Instead, he embraces narrative and figurative clarity. Wayne Thibault became synonymous with his still life of food, objects, and table arrangements. Thibault began producing landscapes in the 1960s. He used his characteristic candy-colored palette and painterly technique, capturing his Californian surroundings. A second-generation New York school artist, Wolf Kahn, was known for luminous lyrical paintings of forests and farmlands that combined realism with the immediacy of abstract expressionism. American artist Richard Mayhew creates emotionally evocative landscapes that often feature a nondescript solitary tree. In his earlier work, Mayhew limited his landscapes to a spare palette, but in the mid-1970s, he began incorporating bold colors into his work. David Hockney is a British heavyweight artist. His work has evolved over time, and he has experimented with watercolors, photo collage, and even works made digitally on an iPad. Hockney has made landscapes of the Grand Canyon, the south of France, and in recent years, the Yorkshire countryside. 
We have seen artists move from the representational to the impressionistic to the abstract. The reasons for painting landscapes shifted. Where will it move next? Let's have a look at some contemporary artists that still explore this avenue. Inspired by his early training as a geologist, Danish artist Per Kirkeby made semi-abstract paintings of landscapes. The artist renders his scenes with thick, aggressive strokes of earthen hues and glints of yellow and blue, outlining trees, boulders, and figures in black. Via Kelmans is a Latvian-American artist who has long been celebrated for her meticulous renderings of natural imagery, including ocean waves, desert floors, and night skies. Peter Doig is a Scottish-born artist who as a child moved first to the Caribbean and then to Canada, where he grew up. His work evokes a strange and ambiguous narrative, often with a cloying or foreboding atmosphere. Many of Doig's paintings are landscapes, somewhat abstract, with a number harking back to the snowy scenes of his childhood in Canada. Etel Adnan is a Lebanese-American. Color and light are the two dynamics that inform her series of landscape paintings. They are deceptively simple, yet highly sophisticated in composition. Andreas Eriksson's paintings are patchworks of color and textures that suggest tapestries. Harold Ankart is a Belgian artist based in New York City known for his bold color and strong compositions. Clouds, fires, icebergs, and the elements of land mass and water are the identifiable shapes he uses to strip landscape painting down to its basics. In this video, we looked at how Western artists have represented the world through landscape painting, evolving from representational to impressionistic and towards abstraction. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you found it informative and gained some insights. Feel free to subscribe, hit the like button, or leave a comment, question, or future video suggestion below. This has been a Video Production.